My name is Trevor Loudon. I'm a writer and filmmaker from Christchurch, New Zealand. I have spent the last several years in America and have addressed more than 400 audiences in over 40 states. My mission is to expose the influence of radical and terrorist groups in the mainstream political parties, academia, media, and the culture. In my recent travels, I've come across two phrases more and more often, Antifa and Civil War. But who is Antifa? Why are they organizing? What are their goals? I knew from my 30 years of studying radical movements that Antifa would likely be connected to more mainstream leftist organizations. I knew that Antifa was a reincarnation of the so-called Black Bloc, a protest tactic where gangs of black-clad, masked street protesters engage in anonymous violence. These were the anti-Iraq war radicals who rampaged through San Francisco's financial district in 2003. The Black Bloc were part of the Occupy Wall Street movement of 2011. They were responsible for massive amounts of damage and chaos. The Black Bloc came back after the 2016 presidential elections, this time as Antifa. Even more violent, smashing property and viciously assaulting all those who opposed them. There was also another difference. Numerous reports from victims and media alike of police refusal to intervene in incidents of violence. I became increasingly appalled by regular displays of extreme violence and disgusted by a mainstream media which either ignored, excused, or even glorified the thuggery. I think that a lot of people recognize that when pushed, self-defense is a legitimate response to white supremacist and neo-Nazi violence. I decided to do some digging. I immersed myself in the deepest recesses of the internet. Then I reached out to some of Antifa's most prominent opponents. And even if I didn't agree with them on many things, I sought out the most active warriors against Antifa. Steve Dace is a political commentator host of The Steve Dace Show on CRTV and a nationally syndicated talk show host. You know, so much of what we are living through now actually comes from what happened in Italy uh, in the 20s and the 30s, where you saw the clashes between the fascists and the Marxists there. And that's where Antifa comes from, the you know, anti-fascists, people that uh, wanted to go after the Mussolini regime. Leon Trotsky creator and leader of the Soviet Red Army, formed the first Antifa-type units, groups of armed paramilitary thugs used to suppress opposition to communism in the years leading up to the Bolshevik Revolution. The Antifa concept was so successful that Trotsky spread it through Italy, Germany and other European countries the communists were targeting for takeover. Antifa gained fame in the years prior to the Nazi takeover of Germany in 1933. The German Communist Party and the Social Democrats set up Antifa units to wage war on Hitler's street thugs, the brown shirts. From an ideological perspective, it's a sibling rivalry. Hey, we're the thugs around here. No, we're the thugs. Hey, we're the gangsters here. No, we're the gangsters. Hey, we're the tyrants here. No, we're going to be the tyrants. After the Nazis destroyed Antifa and the Communist Party, many former left-wing militants switched sides to the Nazis. It would make sense they would switch sides to the Nazis because they have the same exact plans. They have the same exact schemes. They have the same exact uh, devices. The only difference is which group gains control. And so ultimately, if the other group gains control, of this battle of the wills, if you will, then, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. One internal SA report claimed that 55% of the brown shirt ranks were former communists or socialists. They called them beefsteak Nazis, brown on the outside, red in the center. In the 1980s, black-clad, ski-mask-wearing protesters known as The Anonymous rampaged through German streets protesting against visiting American President Ronald Reagan. I have read and I have been questioned since I've been here about certain demonstrations against my coming. And I would like 
to say just one thing, and to those who demonstrate so. I wonder if they have ever asked themselves that if they should have the kind of government they apparently seek, no one would ever be able to do what they're doing again. Antifa resurfaced in the early 1990s. German communists and anarchists joined forces to combat gangs of neo-Nazi skinheads coming out of formerly communist East Germany. British communists and anarchists form similar units to fight the British National Front. Opposition to a handful of real fascists soon morphed into violence against any opponent of the far-left agenda. The German intelligence service website explains that to Antifa, the word fascist has two meanings. Firstly, genuine Nazis. Secondly, anyone who supports the Western free enterprise system, capitalism. Lauren Southern is a Canadian journalist and free speech activist. She has encountered and confronted Antifa in Vancouver, Canada, the United Kingdom, Germany, New York, and Berkeley, California. Sheltered, nurtured, and funded by left-wing city councils, Antifa became well-established across Germany, especially in the formerly communist East. They have places in Germany, entire cities that I've gone to that are like known as Antifa towns and have their stickers all over and they can't set up police stations there or they'll be shut down and raided and attacked by this militant group. And they've just become a thing since Trump's election in America. They've really just started to get a wave of popularity there. And I'm worried that it's gonna get as bad as it is in Europe. I was interviewing a young man in Germany who was like, please blur my face, please distort my voice in this interview. He wasn't saying anything particularly offensive, just something with a remote right wing. That, that would be a moderate idea in America. And he was so afraid because he said the Antifa in Germany would put him on their website and on their lists and they might hurt his child. They might come after his job, his livelihood, crash his home. There are plenty of stories of the homes of fascists being raided and all their things being smashed. Milo Yiannopoulos is an English-born, American-based political commentator, media personality, and journalist. Milo's speaking events have been attacked by Antifa on several occasions, forcing him to spend half a million dollars a year on personal security. Antifa is an organization that claims to fight fascism, um, being anti-fascist, but is actually you know, the most fascist organization probably in the United States. Um, dedicated to you know, closing down by violent means um, the speech of libertarians and conservatives and basically anybody they don't like. Um, anybody, and, and, and who they don't like is a, is, a, is a net cast very wide. Gavin McInnes was a co-founder of Vice Media. He has challenged Antifa repeatedly in New York and Washington DC. As a teenage anarchist punk, Gavin McGuinness fought Nazi skinheads on the streets of Ottawa and Montreal. When I did my talk at NYU, I got pepper sprayed. Um, we, they wouldn't let my guys in, so they stayed and fought. Two of them got arrested, and they're just fighting, fighting. A mob. I went and did my talk like this. You can barely see, because it keeps dripping into your eyes from your forehead, no matter how much you clean it. And uh, they were screaming, whose campus our campus? Whose campus our campus? In, in, in a catatonic state. <laughs> And I went over to my microphone, there's plenty of mics, and I couldn't do my talk. And the professors, by the way, pretended they were regulating this talk, but they weren't. They didn't kick anyone out. They just said, please sit down, just going through the motions. But they're implicit in all this. And I went over to the guy and I said, here's a microphone, come on up. Let's have it out. And as I brought the microphone to him, the way I describe it is it was like a radioactive dick. So as it got closer, he went, oh, and this sort of, the, whatever you call that meter, that radioactive meter was going closer to him. And he'd go, oh, who's going to And then when it got really near his face, he'd just cringe. And then as I walked away, whose campus, our campus? Who's campus, our campus? Who's campus? And it got louder and louder. Most American Antifa came out of the anarchist movement. They were anti-authoritarian. They wanted no government maximum freedom. 
Today's Antifa will still claim to be anarchist, but in fact have morphed into totalitarian communists. Okay, so Nobody should own anything. So you support communism? What do you fucking think, dude? Do you know, do you understand who you're talking with here? Yes. Do you understand who you're talking with here? Yes. Do you under fucking stand? Yes, I am a fucking communist. Okay? They have no problem saying we are communist anarchists and they wave the hammer and sickle and they've basically been duped by Marxists. So what's the difference between today's anarchist movement and the communist movement? Is there a difference? There's absolutely no difference whatsoever. Lindsay Grathwall is a Bay Area free speech activist, rally organizer and a mother. Lindsay is the daughter of the late Larry Grathwall, once an undercover FBI informant inside the terrorist weather underground organization. This violent revolution they want to bring about for social justice and peace, but how are they planning on bringing about social justice and peace by putting bombs in places where they would kill innocent people? Well, the, these guys actually believed that they were capable of over, overthrowing the government. They honestly believed that they were going to succeed um, and that the only way to accomplish this goal of creating a communist society and government here in the United States was uh, by uh, strategic sabotage. What impassioned you to be involved in this? My dad probably inspires me the most, um, just what he did and me seeing what's going on and how it reminds me of everything that happened to him. That's probably my biggest motivation, aside from the fact that I love this country. I love this country and I'm watching it, in my opinion, I'm watching it fall apart. And I feel like I need to get in there and do something. So your dad, Larry Grathroll, tell us a little bit about what he did back in the 70s that makes him so exceptional. He was in Vietnam. He was uh, in the 101st Airborne. Um, when he returned from Vietnam, he went to uh, University of Cincinnati where he ran into the SDS, which was eventually turned into the Weather Underground Group, which is a domestic terrorist group from the 1960s and 70s. My father was the only FBI informant that was able to penetrate this group when they went underground. He was their runner. He would run messages between the Central Committee and other groups. And so he knew what, what, what the main characters in that group were doing at all times. He watched them plan bombings, um, watched them plan many acts of violence, and Antifa reminds me of the Weather Underground just 30 years later. So one of the leaders of the Weather Underground, who I know your father knew very well, was Bill Ayers. Yes. The famous professor from Chicago yes. who mentored uh, Barack Obama. Yes. Bill Ayers is involved in the leadership of Refuse Fascism, one of the main Antifa groups nationally, actually, yeah. a front for the Revolutionary Communist Party. How does that make you feel, seeing that man, who your father knew back then as a terrorist, now leading Antifa today? Angry. I'm angry. Um, this man should be in jail. Um, him and his wife, Bernadine Dorn, they should both be in jail. They should not be out. It makes me angry because He's out there pushing this, but not only is he out there pushing this now, he's been allowed to push this in our schools for decades. And I firmly believe that his teachings, just him and the liberal teachings, have made Antifa what it is. Jack Posobiec is a highly controversial journalist, activist, and former special projects director of Citizens for Trump. He has served several tours in the Naval Reserves as an intelligence officer. Jack uses his intelligence skills to track Antifa activities. I, I'm not a Nazi. What are you doing, man? You hey. We were told 20 years ago that communism had collapsed, that communism was no longer a problem. Yet we see violence and anarchy on America's streets like we haven't seen since the 1970s. And at that time, we know it was communist directed you know, by the Weather Underground, the Communist Party, USA and others. So why are we seeing this violent, communistic sort of activity today when it's no longer supposed to be a problem? Because while the Soviet Union fell, right, the Berlin Wall came down, sure, that all happened. But the ideology of communism, the ideology of sort of those people in the 70s, 
that, that you mentioned were out there in the streets. From a great part of the United States, certainly in the Democrat Party, those people that were out there in the 70s, uh, Bill Ayers comes to mind, are now tied to the highest levels of the Democrat Party, the highest levels of the U.S. Senate, the highest levels of the U.S. Congress. Uh, they find themselves in many places, uh, George Soros, you know, Wall Street, a billionaire. Uh, and so having this amount of money tied to those ideologies is now, we're now seeing that even though, okay, the, the, the government, the infrastructure of the Soviet Union fell, certainly, uh, but the ideology of communism was not defeated. While researching the funding of these radical groups, I came across information from the Capital Research Center. $50,000 was channeled to refuse fascism through the Communist Party-aligned Alliance for Global Justice. They received a $50,000 grant, which if you trace it back through sort of a liberal group, then a progressive group, then a globalist group, it actually goes back to the Open Society Foundation and George Soros. It's funny because it's almost like getting a game of whack-a-mole with George Soros, but it really does tie back to him in a lot of cases. I sort of look at Antifa as, as the ultimate Cloward pivot plan. They're like the ultimate expression of the Cloward Piven plan. And if you know that analogy, these were two professors at Columbia University in another era who took a look at America and realized she was never going to knowingly adopt Marxism because there's just too much freedom and prosperity out there. People aren't going to give that up without a fight, right? You know, so uh, instead overrun the system with victimology, overrun the system with bureaucracy so that the system collapses and then they feel as if they have no alternative but to turn to government to save us. Antifa is after the exact same thing. Create enough chaos in the streets, create enough bloodshed in the streets, people lose faith in their government. Chaos is the friend of the Marxist. Soviet communist leader Leon Trotsky, a master of propaganda, used the Soviet media to vilify all opposition to communism. Are there parallels with today's media? I think the people who are doing the dangerous stuff, it's not me cracking jokes on stage in front of college students. The dangerous stuff is the media, um, you know, constantly talking about punch a Nazi, you know, to say, you know to asking whether it's okay to punch a Nazi at the same time as branding everyone Nazis. It's the media constantly calling Republicans uh, bigots, anti-Semites, white nationalists, white supremacists on the basis of no evidence whatsoever. And I've been called all of those things, and it's ludicrous. To just be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. This is called concept creep. Activists expand the meanings of words to advance their agenda. To Antifa, fascist, now means anyone who opposes socialism. Racist means anyone who voted for President Trump. There are two steps in this process. First, vilify and dehumanize your enemy. Second, destroy your enemy. You have to understand, like my generation grew up our whole lives watching movies like Indiana Jones, where the coolest thing in the world is to punch a kill a Nazi, right? We watched Inglorious Bastards, which is just get me 100 Nazi scalps. And then we, we grow up through this inauguration election cycle and we're told in university media, all the popular culture that Donald Trump is Hitler. His supporters, those red caps, they might as well be swastika armbands. What are you supposed to do if you are told that this is going to be the rise of a man who you've been taught has killed millions and millions of people? What are you, how are you supposed to react to that? The only logical response to that is to go and try to stop it by any means necessary. Just kill them all. Kill Trump. Let's kill all these Nazis. And again, Trump is a Nazi and everyone who voted for him is, is a Nazi. So let's kill, I don't know, 100 million people. Would that be good? As Marxists are wont to do for their utopias, right? That they haven't planned out yet. In America, almost all major Antifa violence has occurred in cities where the police are reined in by far left Democrat-controlled city councils. Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., Charlottesville, Virginia, Portland, Oregon, Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, California. We found evidence of considerable anti-FA Democrat interaction. Sometimes the ties are personal. 
Among those Choi says committed crimes, Linwood Kane, the son of former Democratic Party vice presidential nominee Tim Kane. Linwood Kane will have to appear in court to face charges for fleeing on foot and obstructing the legal process. Wall Street too. Donald Trump is screwing you. Linwood Kane fought the police and had to be restrained with a chemical spray. In some cities, Antifa has actually penetrated the Democratic Party. In Orlando, Florida, Dylan Tyre leads the Antifa group Knights for Socialism, which is completely controlled by America's largest Marxist organization, Democratic Socialists of America. Dylan Tyre serves on the local DSA Executive Committee. His chairman, Adam Whitmer, doubles as a field director for the Florida Democratic Party. Often, Antifa is funded and trained by Democratic Party allied labor unions. Such is the case in Portland, Oregon. When we were in Portland, there was actually Antifa training that was happening Saturday before the rally in Portland on Sunday. There were posters planted all around Portland that our, our guys got pictures of. They wanted me to go in, and we were going to try to send a couple of our people in there just to find out what they're doing. And I was willing to do it. I said, okay, but I didn't make it in time. So they tried to send a couple of um, other people that I know in there. They Immediately, they were stopped before they could even get up the driveway. What's interesting is that the training happened at the Labor Union building. Yes, it was going on there. And then one of the Antifa people, of course, they all have, you know, um, bandanas on their face. So you can't see who it is. He said he wanted to make it known that not only did they own that building, but they owned three or four blocks, like, the whole, you know, all around there. That our guys needed to get out of there, like, right now. Very organized. It was very, very organized. It wasn't a cheap looking building. It was very nice um, from what I saw the pictures. That's not college kids just protesting. There's money behind these people. Lots of money. When it comes to Antifa thuggery, Berkeley, California is in a class all of its own. Well, I was gearing up to give a regular talk in Berkeley, like one of my college talks, like I always do, um, and we'd had some information that they were going to try some some drama, and then suddenly we heard that the building was on fire and things were being destroyed outside, and it turned out that this armed mob of like uh, 200 well-funded, well-organized, you know, thugs had shown up. Uh, ready for war basically, throwing firebombs at the side of the building, like storming it. The police had been told to, to back off. So I got evacuated from the building and the, you know, the police were just not prepared to protect me or anyone associated with me or my audience. Not necessarily people, fans of mine, but just people who wanted to come and hear what I had to say or even other protesters. They just stood back and allowed this armed mob um, to to destroy a town. I mean, you know, one of the things people always say that they did $100,000 of the damage to, to the University of Berkeley. What doesn't get reported as often is they also did $400,000 worth of damage to downtown Berkeley. It took like a half a million dollars worth of, of criminal damage, you know, looting and destruction because a sassy gay guy likes to make fat jokes and talk about the wage gap. I mean, what what is going on? This is supposed to be the home of the First Amendment. This is supposed to be the land of, you know, of free speech. Often, and Berkeley, California is a prime example, Antifa works hand in glove with the local Democrat-controlled city council. Berkeley Antifa works closely with BAM by any means necessary. BAM leaders, including Yvette Falaka, are very close to the Berkeley City Council. Current Berkeley Mayor Jesse Aragon, former Mayor Lonnie Hancock, and current Berkeley City Councillor Chris Worthington have all been members of the BAM Facebook group. What specifically is it about Milo Yiannopoulos that you and others have an issue with? Well, first of all, Milo Yiannopoulos is a fascist. He's a white supremacist. He's funded by Steve Bannon and Breitbart. He's an acolyte of Donald Trump. And he was on the UC Berkeley campus to try to recruit more fascists. By any means necessary are a group of professors, students, quote unquote, intellectuals publicly stating they believe that right-wingers and 
uh, people they deem to be fascist need to be stopped by any means necessary. That means guns, that means violence, that means potentially killing people, which is a very, very scary thing that is being advocated publicly and with very little resistance in America. Why not be peaceful ab ab about it? Why not, you know, chant and, and, and hold your signs and things, but when you take the barricades and you destroy the building and when you set fires, isn't that counterproductive? I think that the left has been far too timid for mm -hmm. way too long. And it's why we've even gotten in this position where we even have someone like Donald Trump leading a fascist movement as the president of the United States. We need to make sure that we have more mass protests, more militant protests that are mass and militant. Community college professor and anarchist Eric Clanton was arrested for allegedly hitting several people with a bike lock during protests in Berkeley. Right here, motherfucker. Oh shit, he's bleeding. Yo, yo, yo. The ambulance is coming. This becomes a target. I got out of here if I do. Eric Clanton's lawyer is lifelong activist Dan Siegel. Dan Siegel, another BAM Facebook group member, was once West Coast leader of the pro North Korea Communist Workers Party, the Antifa of the late 1970s. When you spoke to the judge, you said, look, people were saying unpleasant things. What does that have to do with the assault that took place? Why is that relevant to anything? I think there was a lot of anger at the demonstration on April 15. These <clears throat> all right people were using Nazi and KKK salutes, waving a flag that has Nazi and KKK symbols on it. People didn't like that. Uh, they was yelling back and forth. Uh, what happened beyond that I think needs to be proven in court. I don't think there is proof that my client attacked anyone. They need moral chaos in a culture. They need to bring a culture to the divisive breaking point where it essentially turns to the strong man, the authoritarian figure that is the leader of their tribe and say, hey, fix this for us, save us from ourselves, bring us order. Uh, and that is the siren's song. I have seen the violence escalate on my tour up to a shooting and then UC Berkeley which was just pandemonium as a direct result of the failure of law enforcement to nip um, these violent incidents in the bud. Hey, how come you guys are hanging back? That would be a good question for the chief of police. I mean, I haven't seen the cops around people and just like beating it's the shit out of each other. It's a public statement, right? Uh, no, I'm just asking you guys. I mean, you're here. I would defer you to our public information officer. So they told you to hang back? As I said, I refer you to our public information officer. What's your next question? I mean, I'm just wondering why I've been I've been watching all day people get get you know beat up pretty bad. I haven't seen you guys around much. Mm-hmm. Okay. And they practically send a signal that you can come and you know come and have a go. You know, by Policing so badly, so lightly, so hands off, and basically letting people get away with murder, they're sort of sending a signal to, pro to, to violent protesters, to, to organizations like Antifa. That if you show up and you want to beat people up and smash up property, we're not going to stop you. Uh, that for me is just you know, like the definition of dereliction of duty for a law enforcement agency, and it's got to stop. If you no longer have a platform to discuss, which the conversation very quickly went from, uh, should we allow free speech to, should we ban hate speech to, should we respond to hate speech with violence? Once the conversation has gotten to that point, there is no more capability for the right and left to communicate at two different tables and bring their ideas. The only possible conclusion is violence. And these guys are being exposed for what they are. They're not freedom fighters pushing for less government. They're brainwashed communists trying to kill people. Milo's event, there were people being on the streets that were just being beat with sticks, innocent women just being pepper sprayed, just everywhere we went, there was piss being thrown on us, explosives being thrown at us, bricks being thrown at us, we were being beat, punched, everything. And at one point, you're gonna snap. August 2017, a Unite the Right rally is held in Charlottesville, Virginia. This was not like previous rallies. It was not led by peace-loving patriots infiltrated by a few crazies. 
This was a rally of genuine white supremacists, bona fide Nazis, and Ku Klux Klansmen. If you are walking down Main Street America, waving a Nazi flag, one, you're a moron, two, you're a terrible person. White lives matter! White lives matter! The whole event was a disaster waiting to happen. Thousands of activists swarmed on the town looking to confront Nazis. Workers' World Party brought a contingent to confront the cops and their Klan running dogs in Charlottesville, Virginia, as part of a battle to take down altars to racism, what the media cynically calls Confederate monuments. It wasn't just Antifa, it was Democratic Socialists of America, International Workers of the World, the Party of Socialism and Liberation, and the pro-Russia Workers' World Party. Essentially, what you're dealing with, from a worldview standpoint, are two peas in a pod. Their only argument they really have is, we want to be the thugs in control and not you. We want to essentially do to the people that you're ruling almost all the exact same things that you want to do. We just want to be the one holding the gun to their head instead. The two sides fought for hours. According to several media reports, the only action police took was to steer white supremacists into direct confrontation with the anti-fascists. There is no moral high ground there. The proper antidote to lawlessness is not another form of aberrant lawlessness. The, the proper antidote to lawlessness is law and order, and that is something, true law and order, that neither Nazis or Antifa are advocates for. If nothing is done, if law enforcement do not stop these um, groups who could easily be stopped before they even arrive at the venues. I mean, they advertise on Facebook they're going to show up, for goodness sake. That's how confident they are. That's how ballsy they are. That's how brazen they are. That's how confident they are that they won't be policed properly. If, uh, if law enforcement's not going to do anything about it, you're going to see open civil war between, you know, between conservatives and, and, and progressives. You're going to see more things like shootings at, at college talks. You're going to see more brawls in the street. You're going to see more violence everywhere on both sides. One of the great tragedies of this era is to watch the greatest generation spend untold blood and treasure in their time to defeat Nazism over there so that it wouldn't come here, to defeat Marxism over there in the Cold War so that it wouldn't come here. And we are now, in, in my generation and the one behind me, we are now importing the various worldviews that our grandparents' generation spent their lifetimes attempting to defeat, you know, their, in their natural habitat so they would never come here. Do you remember when the FBI used to go after terrorist groups? They shut down the weather underground. They smashed the Black Panther Party. They reduced the Ku Klux Klan to a shadow of its former self. Why aren't the authorities going after today's terrorist group? Why aren't they going after Antifa? Antifa is at war with your government. Why aren't your authorities fighting back? The president promised law and order in his convention speech last year. I'd like to see him live up to that promise. Because I think there's a lot of Americans dying to see someone just spank these brats once and for all. If Antifa violence remains unchecked, what will be the consequences? So if you look at your kids, your future, what kind of America do you want, do you want your family to live in? One where where, I can, where we can go to a rally as a family and I don't have to worry about taking my children. You know, when, we, when I went to Portland, one of the hardest things for me was my son, who's 10 years old, wanted to come with me. And um, I wanted to bring him more than anything because, you know, he wanted to go because he loves America just like me. Um, he's very patriotic. He's following in his grandfather's footsteps. Um, and he didn't understand why he couldn't go. And I had to sit him down and I had to explain to him the danger in it. And then, you know, later I showed him the videos of me wearing a helmet and everything that happened. And, uh, and I just think that it's really sad that in America, we can't go to a free speech rally without having to wear helmets and to leave our children at home. Just like the social media censorship you see so much of from the progressive left, 
the outright violence in the streets um, that is fueled by progressive left mantras and executed by Antifa on the streets has a chilling effect on what people feel that they're able to, to say, how they're able to express themselves, the language they feel comfortable using, and the ideas that they feel comfortable expressing. And all of that has an absolutely catastrophic impact. Your police are constitutionally bound to protect every American citizen's right to free speech. What will happen if the police are prevented from protecting Americans exercising their First Amendment rights? Every American's right to speak freely must be protected at all times by county, state and federal law enforcement authorities. Most people, regardless of how they vote in this last election, don't want to live in an America that looks like the Berkeley campus. Your founding fathers enshrined free speech as the very first amendment to your constitution. They understood that free speech is your most important protection against tyranny. The Constitution, this is not the time to walk away from it. This is the time to come even closer to it. This is the time to assert it more. This is the time to use it more. Be radical in standing for the Constitution. Free speech is never free. It must be fought for by every generation. What are you going to do? And history, Trevor, shows us all throughout cultures that see these sorts of clashes in the streets, we all know what the next step is, tyranny. In a perfect world, I shouldn't have to be fighting for freedom, it should just be. Um, I would love to be able to just spend, you know, all my time with my kids, um, but the way I look at it is, is that I wouldn't be doing anything else than this right now because our country needs it and I want this country to be better for my kids. I want them to be able to stand, in, like I said, in the middle of San Francisco with their flag and be proud and not be afraid to do it. The United States of America is the bastion of free speech. If that liberty is lost here, it will die in every corner of the world. Please, America, do not allow that to happen.